the Oral History Criminology and Criminology Project, in conjunction with the American Society of Criminology, is pleased to present an interview with John Law. We're joined, uh, we're joined by John here May 4th, 2015, here in his office at the University of Maryland, uh, where in a few weeks he will uh, retire. Uh, for those of you who aren't immediately familiar with uh, Dr. Lobb's work, uh, just a brief sketch here uh, with some assistance by, uh, helpful assistance by John here in condensing his CV. John began his undergraduate career at the University of Illinois at Chicago Circle, earning a BA in 1975. That university subsequently became the University of Illinois at Chicago. From that point, he uh, pursued his education at uh, the State University of New York at Albany in the School of Criminal Justice, earning an MA in 1976 and a PhD in 1980. From there, he uh, assumed an academic appointment as assistant professor at the College of Criminal Justice at Northeastern University in 1981, and he left as a professor in 1998. Then uh, arrived at the University of Maryland, uh, where he now resides as a professor in criminal, uh, criminology and criminal justice, uh, named as a distinguished university professor in 2008. He's also a faculty associate at the Maryland Population Research Center. Uh, he was from two, uh, 2001 to 2006. He served as editor of the Journal of Quantitative Criminology from 1991 to 1996. Um, most recently, he was appointed uh, by President Obama and confirmed by the U.S. Senate as director of the National Institutes of Justice, where he served from July 2010 to January of 2013. He's held a number of positions at Harvard as well, uh, where he's a visiting uh, fellow at the Center of Criminal Justice uh, at the Harvard Law School from 1984 to 87. Uh, he was at, at the Henry A. Murray Center, Radcliffe College, where he was a visiting scholar, fellow, and then affiliated scholar over the course of 19, from 1998 to 2005. He was also uh, held an appointment at the Institute for Quant Quantitative Social Science for, from 2005 to 2010. In terms of his scholastic record, there are a couple of major highlights uh, in John's career. Uh, a co-authored work, uh, Crime in the Making, Pathways and Turning Points Through Life, with uh, Dr. Robert Sampson in 1993, uh, won the Outstanding Book Award from the ACJS, the Michael J. Hindelang Award from the American Society of Criminology, and the Albert J. Reese Distinguished Book Award from the American Sociological Association, Crime, Law, and Deviant Section. Ten years later, in 20, uh, 2003, Shared Beginnings, Divergent, Life, Divergent Lives, Delinquent Boys to the Age of 70, uh, also swept those three awards at that point as well. He was named American Society of Criminology Fellow in 1996, served as president in the, uh, as a term in 2002, 2003. In 2005, he earned the Edwin Sutherland Award from the American Society of Criminology. And in 2011, he earned the Stockholm Prize in Criminology from the Swedish Ministry of Justice. John lists his research interests under three broad uh, headings one of which was crime over the life course. Uh, the aforementioned books detail out that theoretical um, perspective in a number of different ways. Uh, he studies desistance uh, in terms of marriage, it's a, the effects of marriage, the effects of employment, and the effects of military service on the desistance process, as well as a number of methodological matters um, bound up within that uh, larger body of work. He also studies the history of criminology, uh, criminology in the making, uh, in 1983, in many ways is kind of a, an appropriate coda to the, those earlier efforts in oral, oral history, uh, the beginning and the, and the very tail end here. He's also um, compiled the work of Travis Hershey's work under the title of The Craft of Criminology, papers by Travis Hershey, 2002. Uh, uh, under the broad umbrella there of the history of criminology, uh, some of the important contributions, signal contributions he's made. Um, is a look at the sutherland gluck debate that was an animating debate in terms of defining um, the trajectory of the field, if you will, um, and some of the early contributions to this project uh, as well. And so another uh, aspect of why this is particularly appropriate. Thirdly, uh, studied crime and public policy. Uh, some of his early work looked at youth crime trends with uh, Philip Cook. Uh, he's also uh, endeavored in explaining aspects of victimology, the victim offender overlap, as well as more recently translational criminology. There are several other foci that uh, 
uh, populate his, his uh, curriculum vita, one of which is crime patterns. Uh, early on, you discuss things like race, racial patterns, disparities, urban-rural di uh, divides, as well as uh, disparate reporting rates. Um, more recently, you've uh, explored issues relevant to the ecology of crime with David Kirk. Uh, so I suppose w without further ado, we'll, uh, we'll segue into uh, your life before before you became a criminologist here. Okay. <laughs> well, just two things, though, before we, we, we go to that uh, point. I think because we're both interested in history, uh, one correction. Today yes. Is, today, today is May 5th, not May 4th. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, and secondly, uh, thanks to my uh, departmental chair, I will actually be engaging in a phased retirement ah. at the end of this academic year, reducing my time to 50 percent. Okay. And being in resident one semester as opposed to two. So that's, All right. that's a piece of information that's you good. didn't have. That's good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, where do you want to start? Uh, I, I suppose, uh, give us a story of your background uh, coming up in Chicago. Uh, earlier discussions with you uh, revealed that you had an LEAA appointment uh, yes. in your undergraduate career. Right. Well, Some of the influential mentors that you encountered at the right. Chicago Circle, which many people might not know about. Okay. Uh, well, as, as you know, I grew up in Chicago, working class family. and. Uh, was uh, set during my high school years to be a Chicago police officer uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, ended up going to a, uh, the University of Illinois Chicago Circle campus, which announced during my senior year that they were starting a major in criminal justice. So I was able to hop on the L and, and go to school and still stay home with my uh, delinquent friends on weekends <laughs> and, uh, and, and begin a college education. And, so I was a criminal justice major from the day I arrived on campus and had, uh, I have to say, an extraordinary set of undergraduate yeah. professors in criminal justice. Uh, a then brand new assistant professor who taught research methods named Michael Maltz. Um, theorists like Sandy Sherizan, Larry Tiff, Dennis Sullivan, uh, Jim Carrey, who did a lot of work on the history of the Chicago School. Uh, and I think what was important about the University of Illinois Chicago Circle for me was not only extraordinary professors in, in criminal justice, but also extraordinary professors outside. So Frank Morn, who was an assistant professor at the time, was working on his book, The Eye That Never Sleeps, was the history of the Pinkertons. Uh, there were uh, folks in sociology doing interesting work, like Sherry Diamond, who's now at the uh, 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 ABF Law Center, part of Northwestern in, in Chicago. So that really turned me around in terms of thinking about um, moving into an academic appointment, uh, an academic, a more academic career yeah. than I anticipated. Uh, one thing that was influential as well was um, uh, my senior year of, of co college. That summer, I had a, a LEA summer internship and worked for Prisoners Legal Assistance. And job was primarily twofold. One was to ensure that inmates who were in the Cook County Jail were getting time, time served credit when they were sent to state prison, uh, and they were spending lots of time waiting, uh, waiting trial. So we're talking about six, seven, eight, nine months, if not more, and ensuring that that time served credit attached to their sentence that would be reduced. And then another piece of it was was working on a series of research projects looking at the effects of bringing in due process into the prison. So once a week, I went out with lawyers to Stateville Penitentiary, and was trying to launch a study to look at whether or not having a uh, right to counsel during a disciplinary hearing made a difference in the eyes of the inmate. Did they feel that they were uh, more likely to get a fair hearing, a uh, fair, uh, fair outcome of that uh, adjudication within the prison? Um, so I decided, uh, and I, so I had an interest in research and at that point decided to uh, pursue a graduate career, but with the idea of really going to Albany for a one-year master's yeah. program and uh, and then come back to Chicago and resume some sort of research experience in the criminal justice area. Uh, I should also mention another influential figure during my undergraduate experience, even though he did not teach, was Hans Maddock, yeah. who was larger yeah. than life uh, yeah. person at that Chicago Circle at the time, and he ran the Criminal Justice Research Center uh, at, at U of I Chicago. So I'd gone out to Albany um, my first year, uh, and it was early in the spring semester. Uh, I received a letter from Prisoner's Legal Assistance, ask, basically inviting me to take a job. Yeah. And uh, pay seemed good. I think it was like $15,000 a year, which seemed like <laughs> a lot of money. And uh, so I remember going to Mike Kindle and I showed him the letter, and he read it and looked at me and handed it back. He said, well, you could do that. 
or he could stay for a PhD. And I said, <laughs> really? Me? And uh, he said, sure. And so I ended up staying and uh, yeah. working with Mike and, uh, uh, and, and he had an influence, a uh, huge influence on my, on my academic career. So I was at Albany for five years and uh, secured a PhD in 1980. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about what made Albany so special? Right? There, well, there was a constellation of faculty, but you also had a cohort of graduate students who, who eventually went on to shape uh, the field. Right. My students accuse me of retrospective bias all the time when I say <laughs> this, but I have to say that uh, being in graduate school was the best time of my life. Yeah. It was, uh, I think, when, first off, the School of Criminal Justice at Albany was a unique place. Yeah. The way that they set up the so-called Albany model, the curriculum, four pro seminars, uh, law, nature of crime, administration of justice, plan change, uh, heavy emphasis on research methods, heavy yeah. emphasis on statistical analysis. I mean, it was the birth of the source book of criminal yeah. justice statistics. Um, and the faculty across the board were extraordinary. Uh, yeah. In my area, criminological theory, Mike Kindelain doing important work in terms of um, empirical testing of theory, uh, the nature and extent of victimization, yeah. uh, and then later on, Travis Hershey uh, was on the faculty, became my dissertation advisor. Um, and then, but you also look on the other side of the fence, uh, Don Newman, who was heavily involved in the APF uh, uh, books on, on prosecution, uh, Jack Kress doing work on sentencing guidelines, Leslie Wilkins, sentencing guidelines, parole decision making, and then people like Hans Toke, who was doing work on police violence, prison yeah. violence, uh, Vince O'Leary, organizational change and how we organize correctional systems. So, and then finally Fred Cullen in the area yeah. of law and social control. So you just had this combination of people doing important work in every important area and then the, as you pointed out, the extraordinary set of graduate students. Uh, I mean, in my, you know, I first met Mike Gofferson as a graduate student at, at, at Albany, and you know, people like uh, Tim Flanagan, um, Tom Bernard, uh, John Goldcamp, uh, Alan Harlan, I mean, so forth, Rob Sampson. Uh, it was just a great group of graduate students, and so it was a very intense environment, uh, intellectually exciting, intellectually challenging, and I think what, what was important about Albany though, was it wasn't so much that we just learned about the substance of criminology and criminal justice. There was also a sense about the discipline mm -hmm. and how, what it meant to be a criminologist, mm -hmm. what it meant to be a scholar. And we were taught to have respect for the discipline uh, in, in going forward. So it was a, it was a, the kind of intellectual environment that every student mm -hmm. should go through. Uh, it was very rich and, and you were constantly being pushed to be better. Uh, the joke was that you're, as a graduate student, your self-esteem increased you know, each mile you were outside of Albany, uh, <laughs> but, but I think in the long run I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Uh, it, was a, it was a great place for me. It sounds like a rather heady time there with the sort of the empirical element there, the source books and the, mm -hmm. the data-driven aspects of things with the theoretical uh, rigor there as well there. I think it, that's right. And, and also just people thinking about things differently. I mean, uh, Leslie Wilkins bringing uh, this notion about kind of operations research to yeah. how we understand decision making. And it really was an interdisciplinary place, which was unusual for what it was trying to do at yeah. the time. It, it was really the first program that said, we have this problem of crime, yeah. let's bring all these different forces to come together and try to study it. And, uh, and I think they were able to, to pull it off in a, in a way that was quite unique. Yeah. Do you see some of the things that you were encountering or exposed to at that, at that stage of your intellectual development there having a kind of a connection to things that you would eventually do? Well, I, I think the one thing that has, that, that's carried with me from that time was uh, the importance of uh, in respect for of data. Okay. And I think that would, that would be the, if there was a, a yeah. single thread through my career, yeah. I would say a respect for data, a grounding in data, and again, I mean, not to sound like a, an old coot, but the importance of before you start analyzing uh, a particular problem, have a really good descriptive understanding of what the problem is. Okay. And I think, you know, I find sometimes today students are much more eager to run a fancy statistical model yeah. without understanding the basic distribution of the problem that they're studying. You know, what's the mean, what's what's uh, the median, and, yeah. and what's the variability around this particular set of, of variables. Descriptive criminology is not terribly exciting, yeah. but it's a provided a, an incredible grounding in terms of what we do, and so that's carried with me 
uh, throughout, uh, I think, in terms of it. And then I think also it's as obvious probably in the life course criminology work, the intense exposure to social control theory, okay. uh, both from the standpoint of Travis Hershey's social control theory, but even thinking about issues of lifestyle exposure theory with oh. respect to personal victimization. Because remember, uh, I, I was yeah. there between 75 and, and 80, so you had um, Mike Kindelang, uh, uh, Mike Offerson, and, and Jim Groffalo were working on yeah. the lifestyle exposure theory. Um, you know, Larry Cohen was hanging around the research center in 1977, so we were getting exposed to the beginnings of routine activities approach yeah. uh, and, and that, those notions. Um, Mike Hindelang, Travis Hershey, and Joe Weiss would begin working on the uh, Seattle project, uh, which was the assessment of measuring delinquency and the comparison across different methodologies yeah. of, of looking at self-report. So the first project that I worked on was actually the self-report methodology piece. So there was a lot of stuff in the air, both on the victimization side, the offending side, the measurement side, but then also the theoretical side that all kind of came together in my five years there. Now, this was one of the first independent criminology, criminal justice departments stand as alone, right. standalone. I'm wondering what was incorporated into that pedagogy, into that, what what were you reading? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what kinds of ideas were informing the well, bedrock think, of the foundation? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, we, we used the nature of crime. We read uh, Gwen Nettler's Explaining Crime. We used a reader by Marvin Wolfgang and Leonard Savitz, as I recall, and Lloyd Johnston. Yeah. Uh, we were also, I think we probably, you know, I know we read Causes. I uh, took a course with uh, Control Theory with Hershey, and we read Causes in that. Yeah. We also, in that course, I'll never forget, we was read Ruth Kornhauser. Oh. Uh, yeah. So we, we yeah. had that. Uh, and then on the criminal justice side, I mean, we, you know, I think lived and breathed the challenge of crime in a free society, oh. uh, President uh, Johnson's okay. commission, uh, but then also a, a series of specific reports, a lot of stuff on sentencing guidelines, which was uh, Wilkins' influence at the All time, right. parole guidelines as well with his work he did with Don Gofferson. Uh, and and then in the law area, I mean, Fred Cohen's course on law and social control was, was one of the best courses I had. Yeah. And that course, you know, really was this very rich law school Socratic method uh -huh. grounding in, in various court cases uh, regarding all around the theme of deprivation of liberty. And not just in the criminal justice realm, but mental health, uh -huh. uh, juvenile justice uh, as well. Okay. Uh, and then the final pro seminar was, was Plan Change, which was a look at individual change strategies. Mm -hmm. So uh, Hans Toke taking the kind of psychologist view of how do individuals change, looking at everything from yeah. Freudian to uh, Carl Rogers uh, to different kinds of behavioral modification. Then there was an organizational component that, uh, that, that uh, Vince O'Leary brought to bear about how do organizations change. And then finally the community change component that Bob Hart taught. And that was largely around things like the uh, Chicago Area Project, mobilization for youth, and, and so forth. And so you had these four pro seminars that you had to take required courses in each of the four. And then you had to specialize in comprehensive exams of two of those four. And okay. I, I did nature of crime and plan change. Yeah. Maybe jumping back a little bit here, do uh, you see any biographical connections, the things that happen to you in life that, that kind of inform why you select that a particular research topic of I, interest? You know, I, I think it's it's kind of easy to say um, in retrospect to connect dots, right. but, but, yeah. but I, I mean, I've, I've been interested in cities growing up in Chicago. Yeah. All right. Uh, for a long time, had an interest in history for a long time, and yeah. the historical interest was not necessarily driven by an interest in the history of crime or criminology yeah. or criminal justice, but it was you know really fueled by listening to Studs Terkel show and Studs interviewing people on uh -huh. uh, public broadcasting, yeah. <laughs> uh, and you know it, that started early on in wow. my life, uh, and that was a huge influence. So I've been drawn to the history history piece, been drawn yeah. to the city piece yeah. uh, uh, for a long time, and I think crime just becomes part of that discussion. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I ended up doing my dissertation on the comparison of urban and, urban and rural crime, and yeah. so again, it shows that interest in cities and the equality early on. Okay. Um, um, looking at the the body of work that you've done, um, do you see any common thread there that, that kind of ties in terms of thematic uh, elements there? It seems like early on in your career, if you look at your CV, um, there are a number of different strains. Mm -hmm. In 93, 
things really change rather dramatically there in terms of that's more of a kind of a signature dynamic there. Well, I think the I think there's kind of two two phases. Uh, phase one would be the period from 1980 to about 1986, okay. where uh, a lot of what I was doing was extending the work of Mike Hindelang. All right using victimization data to study youth crime. All right. And so those were my earlier projects. That's where I became interested in the trends in juvenile violence. Um, and then the other piece of that was extending Mike's work in the area of victimization. So okay. I began looking at patterns of victimization, victim reporting to the police, so on and so forth. But then the other piece that I had that, that quite frankly was not celebrated at Albany as much as I thought it should be, yeah. was the historical piece. Yeah. Uh, my original dissertation was to, to look at the history of crime statistics yeah. and got some encouragement for that, but at the end decided to abandon that, more for practical reasons. Right. But it was hard trying to come up with a committee who would be interested in a historically based dissertation. Right. Um, so I, I kept the historical piece going as well with the work on the oral history of criminologists, criminology yeah. in the making, and that was, that was very important to me. But the world changed quite dramatically with the unexpected discovery of the Gluck's data. Yeah. And, and once that occurred, I think that, that led to a whole new arena yeah. in terms of focus. Um, I still kept with, as you noted, uh, what, what I call the, the once a decade paper with Phil Cook, yes. starting in 86 <laughs> and doing something in the 90s and doing something again in kind yeah. of early 2000. Um, so I did have an interest in that. Uh, I did have some work too early on in the juvenile justice area, which yeah. I pretty much have moved away from, although now in the in the kind of more of a life course perspective what's the um, effect of juvenile sanctions on yeah. later adult development so it's it's still there so i i think the the kind of fundamental questions in some ways are still there okay you know what causes crime what's it look like over time uh what could we do about it in terms of public policy or practice and so forth but clearly the the discovery of the gluck data was a watershed in terms of intellectual development um, do you, do you think all those disparate th threads there inform the development of a, a life course developmental kind of approach there? Because it seems like it captures many of the, the aspects there. Well, I think you could put all those things into the life course framework, yeah. but it wasn't, it wasn't a conscience right, connecting right. of the dots yeah. at, by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. Because I, I feel really more, I mean, not to use the somewhat over, overused term turning point, yeah. but it did seem like the discovery of the Gluck data was a turning point, an yeah. intellectual turning yeah. point, that changed the way that I thought about things and the kinds of how I spent my time. Okay. Uh, not an awful lot about uh, how that discovery occurred has made the, the public record there. Right. Uh, I've been privy to some email banter back and forth there where you kind of outline here how this process well, be actually be, you in give us Well, in response to a question that Frank Collin yeah. asked me yeah. uh, about, because he teaches yep. the class, and, and uh, he said, can you tell me a little bit more? And I ended up, it was somewhat cathartic to write yeah. three pages on it, which I'd be glad to share with sure. you. Sure. Uh, I could send that to you. But it, where, where this came about was, as you mentioned, I became a, a, a fellow at the Center for Criminal Justice at Harvard Law School. And what that meant, it was a paper appointment, but it gave me a Harvard ID, which allowed me access to the Harvard libraries. Uh, the, uh, Dan McGillis, who was the associate director, Phil Hyman was the director, Dan McGillis was the associate director. Dan and I met at a um, conference that the Northeastern University sponsored on mediation. And again, this was my victim interest in terms of thinking about alternative dispute resolution that possibly could benefit victims of crime. And I was very interested in mediation type programs. They were very popular in Cambridge, Mass. At the time, um, the, the district attorney, Scott Harshberger, was very innovative in many ways. And yeah. he was looking for different ways to change the, the kind of how we do business in the courts. And so, Northeastern sponsored a little conference on, on mediation programs, what do we know, and Dan was there and Dan and I said this would be great if we could launch some programs but also begin to do some evaluations. Uh, do they in fact benefit victims? Do they have better outcomes? 
So that was the kind of general reason to come in and join the Center for okay. Criminal Justice. Um, but I also was at the point where, so this was 1985, the Criminology and Making book was published in 1983. A lot of people were asking me if I was going to do a second book. I was thinking about actually had a table of contents for Criminology and Making Part 2 and identified people I thought would be good because that book really focused on the period of 1930 to 1960. And then the, the later one would be 1920, uh, excuse me, 1960 to 1980 ish. Okay. Uh, and so, but then I also said, well, maybe what I should do is go back and look at the origins of American criminology as a kind of pre criminology in the making, uh -huh. try to get a better understanding of the criminology in the United States between 1900 and 1930. All right. And that led me to Sheldon and Eleanor Gluck. And so I went over to the law school library curious about the Glucks. Uh, and so I met with uh, the archivist Erica Chadbourne and I asked her um, you know, what she had and it turned out they had a mother load of information about the Glucks. It was yeah. one of the largest holdings in the Harvard Law School Library. Their personal papers, manuscripts, what have you. And it was just overwhelming uh, yeah. how much stuff they had, about 90 feet of shelf space in terms of their papers. And so and I asked Erica whatever happened to their data, and she had no idea what I was talking about. And so um, I tried to explain what data are as best <laughs> I could, and uh, she said, I think what you're looking for we have in storage. Let me take you down to the sub-basement. We went down to the sub-basement of the Harvard Law School Library. Um, <coughs> she opened up, you know, unlocked doors, went yeah. into a storage shed, and turned on this 40 watt light bulb and there were boxes there and so what I did was I said this is it these are the data this is what I was looking for yeah. so she allowed me to come in within one day a week yeah. for about four months and just went through box by box and uh -huh. wrote her a memo basically saying boxes one through ten were the 500 criminal career men studied by the Glucks here's what that was about Boxes 11 through 15 with 500 delinquent women. Here's what that's about. Went on and on. Yeah. And of course, the unraveling data were part of that. Yeah. So this is now 1985, 1986. Think about what's going on in criminology. Criminal career reports coming out. Yeah. Goffs and Hershey, Asian crime, yeah. uh, <coughs> so forth. Wilson and Hernstein, crime and human nature. And I remember calling up my friend Rob Sampson from graduate school and said, uh, Rob, I'm sure there's a data tape here somewhere. Uh, uh, as soon as I find it, I'll, I'll let you know. And Because we talked about writing a paper together since graduate school. Yeah. And I said we could write a quick and dirty, was the yeah. word I used, a quick yeah. and dirty paper to look at whether or not what the Glucks found about families in crime held up using more robust modern day statistical techniques. Well, needless to say, there was no data tape, and nor was there any quick and dirty paper. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we ended up, you know, looking at the, the criminal career report was an important part of the story, um, and that report basically bemoaned the lack of longitudinal data yeah. on serious yeah. persistent offenders, particularly over different life phases. Oh, right. And here we have the three-way of longitudinal design of the Glucks. Uh, 500 serious persistent delinquents in reform school, yeah. average age 14, followed up to 25, followed up again to 32. And so, um, and the other thing that happened was um, I, I became at that time uh, affiliated with the Henry Murray Center, mm -hmm. which was a center for the study of lives. So this notion about looking at lives over time, I, I started to think about outside of criminology, and that was a very influential piece. And at the same time, Rob Sampson became involved in what was the uh, planning that eventually led to the Project on Human Development in Chicago Neighborhoods, a series of meetings yeah. starting in the 1980s about yeah. the kind of grand longitudinal study. So there were lots of different forces okay. that were coming together. Uh, you may know that Al, um, um, Reese. Uh, Al Reese was part of the Project on Human Development ultimately, but Rob also did a a postdoc with Al Bloomstein oh, in the right. early yeah. 80s and so he was exposed to the criminal career piece because of our relationship with Mike and Travis we were con exposed right. to their work and so we felt we were kind of in the middle of this right. format that was going on and what we wanted to do was kind of 
carve out a, a if you will, a third way of, yeah. of reconciling some of the positions, but also using the GLIP data as our, our vehicle to do that. So we wrote a grant proposal to the National Institute of Justice, and much to our surprise, they gave us funding to <laughs> reconstruct the GLIP data archive. So how does the theoretical model eventually come out of this quick and dirty paper? There? Well, I think what happened was, first off, the, the data were quite rich. Yeah. And, and I think the, the theoretical model really came when we began to be exposed to uh, the Murray Center, okay. the Center for the Study of Lives. Michael Rudder was on the board, the work of George Valiant in terms yeah. of the natural history of, of alcoholism, Lee Robbins, children who uh, grown up, deviant children grown up. Yeah. But then another piece of that Murray Center experience was the exposure to Glenn Elder All right. and the life course work. And so, um, and I think what, what, what the motivation was, was this idea that you, know, you had uh, Bloomstein at all saying that there was the, the kind of criminal career paradigm and that there were multiple groups and some offenders did not age out of crime. Mm -hmm. And then you had Goffs and Hershey basically saying, well, everybody ages out of crime and yeah. what generates the differences in offending is, is low self-control, which is set in early childhood. Yeah. And once that's set, there's not much you could do about it except wait for the age crime to decline. And so what we wanted to do was try to bring together all these different perspectives that were swirling around, okay. um, particularly from the life course area, thinking about trajectories. So you have an offending trajectory, you have a family trajectory, you have a work trajectory, but then also embedded within those trajectories are transitions, and some of those transitions may in fact be turning points. And so the idea was to kind of take the kind of basic of classic social control theory, mm -hmm. but put it in this more dynamic longitudinal framework and really try to understand not just continuity, not okay. just change, but continuity and change uh, over the lifespan with respect to offending. And, and that's how it kind of all came together in using the Gluck's data to test some of those theoretical ideas. Okay. I wonder if there's any connection to Hans Modick's uh, work there on what happened with a cohort of people that were uh, put into the military. Well, we, we was that happen later? Was that well, we were we we used that work because of so many of the Glock men were in yes. the military. Yeah. And uh, so, but I don't I don't recall it as being central to sure. thinking at that time. But, well, but it clearly fits within that, yeah. that framework yeah. um, a, a, as well. Yeah. Um, we'd be remiss if if we overlooked another aspect of, of your career here, especially of late. There, you, you also wore a, a pretty uh, important administrative hat. Uh, can you speak to us a little bit about your accomplishments and things that uh, you left in terms of maybe an imprint at yeah, NIJ? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, so here you have the roughly period from 1980 to um, 2005, 2006 of kind of yeah. a very successful, I mean, I've had a blessed career. And yeah. It's been turned out better than I ever imagined. I mean, you know, you, you, I, you never anticipate, in my view, you don't write books to receive book awards. Yeah. And so to be able to have that happen is, is extraordinary, and to have it happen twice for the same project with, <laughs> with my co-author is, is, is uh, uh, you know, above and beyond. Stockholm Prize was oh, yeah. you know, totally unexpected as well. Um, but I also had a, a sense, and you could see this beginning when I was president of the American Society of Criminology, mm -hmm. a concern about a disconnect between theory, research, and policy. Right. And the theme of the ASC uh, annual meeting when I was president um, was, uh, and I never could, you know, I think it was the um, um, public policy and the benefits of theory, something like right. that. I could get the exact phrase, but I always forget. But the idea was that you can't talk about theory without talking about policy, and you can't talk about policy without talking about theory. Yeah. Uh, they, they work hand in hand. Yeah. And, and so um, I had this nagging discontent about that and never imagined that I would go to the National Institute of Justice, but when um, the opportunity arose to, to kind of put a plug in for, um, or not a plug in, but to offer up help, yeah. I'd be yeah. glad to help and I expected that I would help people identify people who could be the NIJ director. Um, it turned out that I was asked to, to throw my hat in the rain and, yeah. and, and did. And so uh, through a long process was able to join the Institute in July of 20, uh, 2010 and stayed for a roughly two and a half year period. Uh, I, think, I think NIJ's mission is, is, is unique. I think it has to produce rigorous research, mm -hmm. but at the same time that research has to be 
relevant. Yeah. And so um, to kind of bring those two R's together, if you will, yeah. I wanted to unify um, the, those, the relevance and rigor into this idea of translational criminology. Uh, so a big piece of that was trying to provide some umbrella for the institute going forward. But the other thing I wanted to do was try to um, move research in ways that I thought the field needed, and, and I thought NIJ should be in that space. Um, so for instance, um, we had one of the uh, you know, massive increase in the use of incarceration yeah. in the United States. NIJ had no systematic research portfolio looking at the causes of that oh. run-up and the consequences. Hmm. So I wanted to, and to, with the help of uh, MacArthur Foundation, we jointly funded the National Academy Sciences panel to look at the causes and consequences of high rates of incarceration. NIJ uh, during the 90s did some work in this area but had no systematic research portfolio mm -hmm. looking at the crime trends and again one of the biggest things happening in criminology, criminal justice over the last mm -hmm. is the 40 year, you know, it, last 40 years is the huge crime decline. Yeah. And so we funded the National Academy of Sciences to do a round table on crime trends that uh, Rick Rosenfeld and others are, are leading. Uh, and then. Um, areas of desistance from crime, yeah. um, victim offender overlap that you mentioned, and I think the last but not least was looking at um, what do we know about the, the, the variation in, in victimization by race. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we were able to move into some new areas which I thought were central to the field, but at the same time keep NIJ's investment in kind of what I would call their signature programs, which is policing. Um, domestic violence, violence against women, uh, uh, dating violence, and, 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 and offender reentry. So I was really trying to make a co more coherent research portfolio and again trying to move into these areas that seem to be so big we're crying out for attention. Right. And if NIJ is not there, who's going to do it? Right, right. Um, I guess going back to the, the academic realm of, of your work here, um, I think it's oftentimes important for Criminology to recognize the importance of debate and exchange of ideas here is promoting growth and challenging ideas and responding to that can produce um, better, uh, better, more rigorous kind of thinking here. Uh, to my eye, I see a couple of important debates that, that you were uh, played an important role there in terms of uh, promoting our thinking on, on a couple of different fronts here. I suppose maybe we we'll just take them one at a time here. Uh, one of which was a sort of this issue of desistance. There, uh, there's an important debate. To, that uh, the social control folks had with uh, uh, the social learning folks. Uh, folks like Mark War were pointing to this idea of desistance being sort of a, a pattern process where you're less likely to hang out with your peers as opposed to the social control mechanisms there being the, the operative element there. Can you talk to us about that debate sure. and how that, that kind of uh, settled itself? And where well, I think it's, I, I don't think it's settled actually. Sure. I think the, I think the, the kind of question that's on the table right now for desistance research is trying to sort through what are the underlying mechanisms uh, for uh, reductions in offending that we see as a result of institutional involvement. All right. Let's take the example of marriage. Yeah. Um, there seems to be pretty strong evidence across the board in a variety of studies now that there is a marriage effect, that, that strong ties in, in a marriage leads to a reduction in offending. Um, but I think what is at dispute is the meaning of that relationship yeah. Yeah. and whether it is social learning, social control, um, change in identity yeah. prior to becoming married and, and so forth and so on. And I think what we really need to do as a field is is move closer to trying to sort through what some of those mechanisms are. Um, and, and so that's where I think, um, so I don't think it's resolved, uh, but I do think we have now different arguments about why those things matter yeah. and then the second piece would be trying to get some data that would provide some insight. A uh, paper recently that, that I'm actually very proud of because they're two of my former students, Elaine Doherty and Bianca Bersani, actually in criminology recently tried to get at this very issue where they kind of took the marriage effect as a given mm -hmm. and they said, okay, now we want to look at what it could be. Is it a matter of changing opportunity or is it really changing one's propensity to offend? And, oh. and they used the vehicle that they used was um, divorce. And, uh -huh. and how did that change then uh, subsequent behavior? Huh. And so I think that people are beginning to think about this. Uh, similarly, with some of Dave Kirk's work about yeah. residential relocation, you know, what is it about that? Is it yeah. is it a change in terms of exposure to different networks? Is it 
mm-hmm. uh, removal from one's previous delinquent past, one's uh, delinquent peers, and so forth. And again, I think trying to get at some of those mechanisms is the next question that we have to address. But but the systems is on the map now. It is. Yeah. I think that's fair to yeah. say. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think in terms of, uh, I think it's it was when you think about the criminal career paradigm, yeah. there was the least work in the area of desistance when okay. that report came out. And uh, I think now that's shifted quite dramatically. And I think people are very interested in that question. And I will tell you that uh, it also has a direct links to policy, which makes it, uh, you, you were able to talk about desistance at the National Institute of Justice because of the concern about offender reentry. Oh, all right. Um, the second uh, issue here, I think, is a little bit more methodological here. Could you maybe s- spell out the sort of disputes here in terms of how many trajectories are there? Is, is it an important debate? To, well, I think know? it is because it, it's fundamentally about whether or not, about how we conceptualize the deep, how we conceptualize and measure the dependent variable. Right. And I think it's, it's a methodological debate that has theoretical implications. Right. And so if you believe that there are different causes for different either offense types mm-hmm. or offender types, yeah. then typologies become your grounding by virtue uh, of how to do that work. If you take the approach that there's versatility in offending, so that the distinct offendings are really more uh, a result of opportunity, um, and then also I think at the same time are the causes of offending the same across different offenders, yeah. um, then you would um, uh, move away from a typological approach and look more at a general theory okay. or a general approach. So, so I think it gets at a, a fundamental question, which is how do we conceptualize and measure the dependent variable? Yeah. And again, I, I don't think there, that's resolved right. uh, in, in many any way. And, and we've used trajectory analysis very fruitfully in our work because going back to what I said earlier, yeah. um, trajectory analyses um, sometimes are, I mean sometimes, oftentimes, are a very good way of describing your data yeah. and being able to get a sense of what the distribution looks like in, in your own data. Uh, it's what, what I think uh, we were um, reacting to was some of the first order assumptions that you start with a typological right. approach. And we were often saying that the, uh, the methodology should be driven by the research question, not the reverse. Oh, all right. That sounds like it goes back to some of the things that informed your graduate school experience there. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, which that kind of segues into, quite naturally, um, a, a very important debate there uh, between the, the sort of aspects within social control. Right? Mm-hmm. So it's sort of an inter, uh, between family member dispute here that's yes. kind of taking place there. Uh, yourself and, and Rob Sampson on one end there, uh, working on this developmental kind of tangent. Um, and then Godfrey and Hershey there uh, right. arguing for self-control. Right. Um, how did that debate produce some insights there that may not have happened there, but but for those those interactions between the two the two sides? Yeah. Well, I think that um, you know, we did not write crime in the making with the idea that it would challenge. Yeah. Yeah. The theory. Sure. Um, it turned out that many people interpreted. Yeah. The crime in the making has been the counter, and so suddenly I think we began seeing papers or even uh, I was told comprehensive exam questions comparing Goffs and Hershey to Samson and Lowell in terms yeah. of what the issues are. Um, I think I think that we had some fundamental differences yeah. in terms of we did not believe that self-control can explain the very all the variation in later adult outcomes. Yeah. I think our our data demonstrated that taking self-control into account still allowed for the effects of marriage work to have uh, uh, effect on offending, and so um, I think that that was a point of difference um, between us. And and I think what's kind of interesting now in my view is that I, I think in terms of the, the work over the last 15 years, 25 years, 20 years, 25 years, there there seems to be a lot less difference between Goffs and Hershey and Samson Lobb yeah. in many ways. I think what yeah. what's happened is um, we've talked more about control theory yeah. as opposed to self-control versus social control. Oh, all right. And I also think that there are ways of incorporating uh, our perspectives um, together. I yeah. mean, we never said self-control was was unimportant, huh. but at the same time, we did recognize for variability and the and and I think the importance of adult outcomes. I remember when I interviewed Travis Hershey. Um, you know, he he said in the interview, and I don't remember the exact words. He says, "But I, I quit smoking, and uh, it's probably an age effect, but." 
it could have been a change of propensity from some external force. And so, <laughs> and again, I think part of it is too, we don't have, I don't think we have good data to yeah. truly adjudicate between those competing perspectives. Uh, one of the you know, things that you know, may be ironic <clears throat> in our follow-up study of the Glucks, I mean, one of the major findings from, from the, the looking at the men's lives from early childhood to uh, in their 60s was um, a direct effect of age mm -hmm. on offending. I mean, we did find that uh, everyone declined with age, and that was an important part of the story. Um, now, we also did find strong effects for marriage, military service, and so forth, yeah. which Guffs and Hershey probably are less likely to believe in, but nonetheless, I think, again, it's not that it was a total rejection and a right. total at loggerheads about yeah. a number of issues, and, and I do think we're both working in the control theory perspective. That's pretty neat. Uh, that kind of sparks a question in my imagination here, that, uh, that do you conceptualize of your life course theory here is more of a, a theory as a theory, or is it more of a framework here? Because you see well, people trying to insert yeah. different aspects and... Right. I mean, I think that the, the life course, the life course perspective, life course theory outside of criminology, I think is a way of um, a set of orienting concepts. All right. It's also a methodology, mm -hmm. and I think it is just a way of looking at the world. Yeah. And wh when I teach crime in the life course, I tell my students that uh, once you take on the aspects of life course thinking, mm -hmm. it's hard to look at the world the same way. Mm -hmm. And giving you an example of that, um, been a lot of talk here, and maybe just because we're in Washington, D.C., a lot of talk here about thinking about uh, Attorney General Holder's comments about race, crime, and justice mm -hmm. compared to the president's comments about race, crime, and justice. Okay. And this was prior to the events of this summer. But, yeah. uh, but there was a sense that Holder was much more out there than Obama. Okay. And you could think about that in a variety of ways. You could think about it politically. The president of the United States was elected, represents yeah. everyone in America. Right. The Attorney General Holder was appointed. He yeah. works for the President of the United States. But I think there's a life course story here. Okay. They're 10 years difference in age. All right. Eric Holder marched for civil rights. All right. Obama was the beneficiary of the marches that Eric okay. Holder did. I think he feels those issues much more acutely because right. he experienced them. So you could, you could basically do a cohort analysis yeah. as to how people view particular events based on where they were yeah. during the historical time. And again, a basic notion of life course thinking is that uh, yeah. historical context influences development. Yeah. And, and that's, that's kind of right there uh, to me. So, so I think that, um, and, and, and I think you raise, your question kind of raises an interesting question I've talked with my students about. When we say life course criminology, does that mean age-graded informal social yeah. control theory, or does it mean something else? Um, and as you probably know, uh, there are other theories oh, yeah. that are oh. calling themselves life course theories. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, you know, Ron Akers has said that everything in life course is found already in social learning theory, so it's, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't, there's no added value here. Yeah. Um, so we, we, I kind of want to leap into the fray here. A paradigm, would that be too strong of a term here? Because it does seem very comprehensive here in terms of it's or as an orienting. Well, I have, I have argued that the life course could serve as a paradigm yeah. for the field of criminology. Yeah. And also, I mean, another thing that I think is, I think has huge implications, uh, Frank Cullen in his presidential oh, address yeah. said that Biology fits within this. Well, not just biology, yeah. but he also said life course criminology is now criminal. Right, right, right. And so, yeah. so I think that it is, it's definitely something that's not going to go away. And right. I think it's fair to say, and, and you could chart the number of papers, uh, just the number of presentations at ASC right. that have phrases life course in them, just in the titles alone, is astonishing yeah. compared to what it was like 25 years ago uh -huh. where, where nobody was talking about this. <laughs> uh, so I think all those questions are good questions, but it remains to be sure. seen how they, fall, how they fall out. Okay, okay. Um, looking back on your career here, of all the things that you've participated in and accomplished, uh, what would you say are one of the two, one or two of the signature aspects of it that you look back on and think that that's, that's where I really nailed it? Well, I think the Gluck Project yeah. as a whole okay. was the most extraordinary part of my career. I also think that 
doing the interviews with the Gluck men yeah. was some of the most enriching research experiences I had, uh, just being able to talk to them about their lives yeah. and, 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 and so forth, uh, both from historical sense, mm -hmm. because these were people in a classic study, but also in a substantive sense. I mean, oh, right. I learned a lot and was humbled by that experience. Yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, that clearly was the, the signature um, program of research writ large. Mm. I think that, um, you know, I'm very proud of the Sutherland Gluck debate paper. Yeah. Where we looked at the correspondence, 25 to 30 year correspondence between Shelton and Eleanor Gluck. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I like the presidential address, I think, right. holds up pretty well in terms of thinking about a life course framework to the history of our field yeah. and trying to identify turning points, which I think generated some debate about what is a turning point yeah. and what's not a turning point in criminology intellectually, which I think is good. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so those things kind of stand out. Um, but as I said, I had a blessed career. Yeah. I mean, what, what is the the field's appreciation for its history kind of stand at this point? Uh, have you made some inroads with that, do you think? I think or? so. I think there's a, I think there's a, uh, well, two things. I'm, I'm of two minds on it. I, I think there's a, a greater understanding and appreciation that we now as a discipline have this trail, if you will. Okay. Right? It's no longer the the new right. field. <laughs> uh, we we're now we're now moving into you know we're, we're what are we third generation right. of, of scholars in terms of if you think about criminal justice programs and criminology programs really coming together in the 60s and 1970s. I mean, we're talking now a, a while ago in terms okay. of those programs. I mean, Rutgers is celebrating their 40, or just celebrated yeah. their 40th anniversary, yeah. for instance. So, so in that sense, I think we do have a greater appreciation for history. At the same time, though, I think as we move from print to the electronic world, I think it, it does become, I mean, if it's not on the web, it didn't happen. Yeah. And that worries me a great deal. And I think that I do worry about the kind of presentism in terms of much of what we do with that regard. Yeah. Uh, Hershey said to me when I, I can't remember if I was a graduate student or a young assistant professor, he said that, uh, John, at, at some point you will understand that we do not do research. All we do is research. Huh. <laughs> and uh, I do sometimes feel like he was right on <laughs> yet again about yeah. that, that we rediscover old truths. Um, and you go back to some of the classics. Yeah. Um, there's, I mean, I was talking to actually to a colleague about this. I mean, think about the Kerner Commission's mm -hmm. report about oh. civil disorders. All right. uh, two, you know, we're moving to two societies, one black, one white. <laughs> right. You could rip the cover off that <laughs> and put, you know, analysis of uh, yeah. Baltimore. Um, yeah. With today's data, yeah. yeah. Um, if you had to do all over again here, is there anything there that you think you would make a d different decision? If you could have a different turning point, I I think that um, I mean one of the questions that I, I I've been asked and I and I don't have a straight answer for, mm -hmm. um, not I don't have a resolved answer, is whether I would study human development. And then look at crime, All right. or be a criminologist to then go outside and look at human yeah. development, and that's something that I, I, I don't know the answer to. Uh, do you think? Do you think that would give you a different perspective, or would it be advantageous in some sense? It may be an advantageous in terms of being able to just come from a, a different orientation about human development, and then kind of looking yeah. at how that plays out in a particular domain. But at the same time, I think I probably would have made the decisions that I've made, yeah. because fundamentally, I mean, crime is an important issue. Yeah. I think it also crime in and of itself raises questions about the social order, yeah. and it also raises questions about what, if anything, can government do about it? Yeah. And, and those are fundamental questions that it treated yeah. me back in the old days and still intrigue me to this day. I mean, I think one of the real interesting things that's happening is with all of the focus on criminal justice policies and mass mm. incarceration and so on and so forth, I mean, I, I think it suggests too that life course theory needs to be expanded to huh. not only look at the effects of individual development on outcomes related to crime, mm -hmm. but what effect do public policies have on individual development? All right. And so I think in that sense, it's, and, and, and ironically, we could be returning to 
crime being a major issue yeah. in a presidential campaign during a time when the crime rates are at record lows. All right. And it's not going to be discussions about crime, it's going to be discussions about criminal justice policies. All right. And those are questions fundamentally about social order. You, you raise an, an interesting question here um, in terms of these disciplinary or interdisciplinary connections here. Mm -hmm. uh, is criminology genuinely interdisciplinary still? Uh, does it still benefit from uh, plugging into these other networks? Or is it a different kind of well, I think orientation these days? Yeah, I think it's, my, my concern is that criminology uh, can be, and in some ways is, becoming more and more narrow. Yeah. And not being able to link to other outside disciplines. Uh, as it did in the past, and I've had discussions and debates about this. Yeah. That people feel it's inevitable that All right. you so you know, classic kind of. I was trained by Travis Hershey, a sociologist. Yeah. My students are trained by me, a criminologist. Okay. And so, in the, who's, what are their yeah. students going to look like? Yeah. And so, I think it's really important to force ourselves to be as broad-minded as we can, and to the extent we can, read outside of our own discipline. Okay. That's challenging oh, yeah. in this day and age yeah. with so much being published. I mean, you know, I, I feel for the students in this day and age. It was, it was pretty clear what journals we were supposed to read when I was a graduate student. Okay. I think it's less clear now, All right. and especially if you use publication as your standard. All right. because. Everything <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> seems to find a way somewhere, somehow, yeah. into what is called the publication. Yeah. And I think it's so how do you get through the kind of glut of material yeah. and figure out what it is you want to read? But I think, I think one has to look outside of the discipline to generate new ideas. And that could also be not just ideas, but also tools. Oh, all right. Uh, techniques yeah. um, that could add a lot, and, All right. and I think we've had examples of this in terms of you know, thinking about how people are using social net, you know, before social network analysis, prior to its use in crime. Yeah, uh, is is an example. Okay, um, you, can you speak to us a little bit about the your mentoring process and your success in, in that venue. You've mentioned a couple papers already that, that right. students have. Uh, right. Well, one of the reasons why I came to the University of Maryland was that at the time the College of Criminal Justice at Northeastern University had a one-year master's program. All right. And I was uh, able to identify really good students and then send them off to places like Albany okay. or Maryland right. or UMSL. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, finally after a while I said maybe I should be at one of those places <laughs> so I could work with this. So I came here really for the opportunity to work with PhD students. Yeah. And, and I've had, I have not had a lot of students, but I have had some memorable students and feel I've been able to develop uh, mentorships. The first student that I worked, well, Kathy Gallagher was the first PhD uh, student that I oversaw. She was doing work in the victimization area, but then Liana Allen did work on military and in, in, in crime, and I chaired her dissertation. Uh, after her, I worked with the uh, uh, Elaine Doherty primarily. I mean, there were other students as well, but Elaine Doherty, mm. and she's now at the University of Missouri St. Louis oh. on the faculty. And uh, my last student, uh, before going off to government, which I had to cut off all mm -hmm. mentoring oh, yeah. during the government experience, was Bianca Bersani, and she's yeah. at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And so I think Bianca, Elaine, uh, Liana have made contributions to life course criminology, which is very gratifying. Yeah. But I also think, I'd like to think that even students who don't work in that area that have been involved on their committees, and in some cases even chairing their committees, uh, have been able to, again, impart a, a, a set of principles yeah. about respect for data, um, taking the work seriously, yeah. uh, and doing the rigorous interrogation of their work to make sure the arguments that they're making. When when I was getting ready to uh, what I f defend my dissertation, uh, Travis Hershey, uh, his response to what I thought was the best draft I wrote, uh, his response was, uh, you have a dissertation, but you don't have a thesis. Huh. And you should think about the difference. All right. Huh. And Tough words, but I imagine that sparked, I well, gotta get to work. Well, right? you gotta get to work and yeah. the whole, what's your yeah. idea and how are you defending it? Yeah. What's your argument? <laughs> and so I'd like to, to convey that to every student I work with, yeah. you know, whether I work with them as closely as I deal with Bianca and Elaine or yeah. not. Huh. 
Uh, you've also had opportunities to publish with uh, quite a few na uh, big names in the field as well. Uh, uh, could you tell us maybe a little bit about what makes those collaborative efforts? Maybe even especially with Rob. Uh, well, I think that's there's 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 three there's there's three apart from the graduate students, there are three collaborations that I've had over my career yeah. that have been you know, more than one-offs. Yeah. And that's the work with Phil Cook. Yeah. You know, we've written three papers together. And Phil and I have, um, we, we, Phil's an economist, I'm a criminologist, different orientation, different ways of thinking about the world. Yeah. And I think Phil and I, though, again, come together over the, uh, the data and a problem of understanding those data. And what we're able to do, I think, is pretty clearly figure out where the expertise lies in writing a particular paper, the person with the expertise takes the lead on it, and then we're very good at kind of finding the connective threads so the papers hold together quite well. Yeah. It's, it's, and then the, the second collaboration um, is with Janet Lawrence and around the area of victim offender overlap and victimization writ yeah. hard. And again, Janet and I have very similar approaches, and, and I think our collaboration works quite well in terms of being able to merge our perspectives in, into one. And, and I think the nice thing about the collaboration with Janet is we're at the point too where we can push each other All and right. as a result the work gets better. Yeah. The collaboration with Samson is is like no other I've had. Yeah. And um, in that um, we are able to go back and forth on a particular paper or a particular chapter and the end result is uh, it, I cannot point to any sentence in any of our work that I say I wrote that. Yeah. It really becomes the the, yeah. the the sum is is greater than its individual parts, and also we are able to and, and often have sat down side by side or over the phone yeah. and have literally written line by line, revised line by line, revised line by line, uh, and so forth. So it's it's a very unusual collaboration. <laughs> it can be. And I don't mean this in a negative way, exhausting. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, 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 we we're both very stubborn, you know, and, and we both uh, we don't give up easily. Yeah. Uh, but I think, as a result, the work has been much better than it could have been otherwise. Yeah. And it's, a, it's been a very rich and rewarding experience. Yeah. So, uh, in thinking about the the search for the soul of criminology here, mm -hmm. what would you say the the soul is at this point? That's a tough question. Yeah, <laughs> maybe it's too abstract yeah, here. That's a, that's a, yeah, that's some, a, some identifiers. Yeah, there. that's a tough. That's a tough one. I mean, I you know, you're, I, I wrote that in when I w did the Sutherland address because I felt that Sutherland was actually searching for that very soul. Yeah, and uh, in t responding to a, a, a vicious and in some ways well deserved critique of criminology from the Michelle Adler yeah. report. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure though where where we are now in yeah. terms of the soul. It's uh, it's it's become a complicated set of issues in terms yeah. of criminology and criminal justice, and and I think also it's going to be interesting to see how we. I think we are also at least in terms of media and public policy attention, really bringing to bear some of the more criminal justice issues okay. to the spotlight. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see how criminal justice and, and yeah. crime kind of compete in that space. Yeah. Um, well, I like the idea of extending out, uh, your idea of extending out uh, uh, age-graded life course uh, theory here to include the criminal justice elements Absolutely. There, uh, because many regard that as an artificial divide there between the... I'm, I'm yeah. with you on that one. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, I mean, my, my PhD is in criminal justice and I went to a school of criminal justice but I always felt of myself as a criminologist. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, at the time, there was a lot of talk about, you know, we should, we should refer to ourselves as criminal justice uh, justicians, and uh, I never kind of liked that thing. It was a, a bit too awkward for my taste. Um, so when I went to my job interview at Northeastern University, um, when, you, when you write your dissertation, all you want to do is talk about your dissertation, yeah. present your dissertation. Uh, Northeastern University invited me to uh, for a job interview, and they actually assigned me a topic to talk uh -huh. about at my seminar. Huh. And, the, and the seminar topic was, what's the relationship between criminology and criminal justice? <laughs> and what I did is I presented the Sutherland definition and oh. basically argued that there is no difference. Okay. One and the same. Perfect. Um, Are we... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, real quick here. If you could sum up the, the value of history to... Could you sell somebody today on the idea that history is important here? Why? 
why why should we look back into the past when we want to predict? Well, except that we need to know where we've come from in order to okay. figure out the prediction. So it's it's, uh, uh, and I think also if if we are going to criticize, um, or in some ways present alternatives to what we're doing, mm -hmm. we need to have a sense of the historical um, okay. development that that led to that. So. Um, so we don't repeat so past we, failures and we don't partly, have to... Yeah, exactly. And, and I just think a greater appreciation for some of the complexities involved. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the debates that are going on now um, are very reminiscent of what we All were right. talking about during the 1960s. And, and I think there's a lot we could learn about opportunities we had that, that of roads we did not take at that okay. time yeah. uh, that could inform our, our current thinking. I think the challenge with, with history is uh, and I know I felt the I felt this with the life coursework, is that you know, we have this longitudinal database of Gluckmen who are all white ethnics from Boston. All right. And yeah. is that relevant for today's society? Okay. And I think it is. Yeah. But you also have to be very cognizant of right. how this, this historical period is affecting development and see where the things may be somewhat different. Okay. Um, and and I think you know to to be Frank, I mean, I think some of the prospects that we saw for pathways out of crime in the mm -hmm. Gluck era are more difficult, if not totally closed, right. in the current era I because see. of things like criminal record checks, okay. because of collateral consequences, because mm -hmm. of longer terms of incarceration, right. uh, and so forth. And I think, but but the only way that you could gain that insight and understanding is through historical comparison. Right. So ultimately, it's 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 you have to you have to bring history into it. In my oh. view. Okay, uh, that sounds like a rather fitting uh, spot to conclude here. Uh, but for uh, any parting thoughts that you may have to uh, offer here in terms of did we miss anything? Or, no, I think we covered. Know, I think yeah, we've covered uh, everything to your satisfaction here. I think we have. And I think sure. I think the other thing that though, um, um, just thinking about kind of signature pieces, yeah, what have you. Um, I think it's important, and, and I mean the the Gluck project was intellectually risky. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think in some ways, criminology in the making and oral history was intellectually. But what risky. made it risky is that too much data, and you were on the tenure clock, or is it more complicated than? Well, we didn't even know when we went into the basement what the, we were <laughs> we were coding for so many months without knowing <laughs> it, it, does this yeah. make any sense? So um, you know. I, we were both tenured faculty member, right. which I think helped a lot. Okay. But I think this idea of, of it would have been very easy to have looked at that and said, we can't do yeah. this. Um, All right. We can't do this. And I think also, I think with the oral history work, interview people about what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you get those kind of reactions. Yeah. And, and also the Glucks were controversial. Um, yeah. I remember being at the criminology meetings and I saw Lloyd Olin and Don Cressy and they asked me what I was working on because I bo interviewed both of them for criminology yeah. and making and I said, oh, I'm thinking about going back and reanalyzing the Gluck data. And Don Cressy said, that's going to kill your career, it's a waste of time. <laughs> And I was, you know, quite frankly, I mean, I said, oh, my God, <laughs> that wasn't the reaction I was expecting. Yeah. And Lloyd Olin, you know, talked him out of it and came and found me, said, listen, yeah. you know. Because he was at Harvard, right? Yeah. All right. He knew. Okay. But we, we had no idea the richness of the data yeah. when we started. Yeah. And that's the point. Okay. We, we had no idea. So, so taking intellectual risks is something that I would encourage young people to do. Easy right. for me to say. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also, I think, you know, Brendan, I mean, to give you kudos, I mean, yeah. Your interest in oral history and keeping this kind of legacy yeah. alive is, is I appreciate you know, that. something that I, I think yeah. is great. So yeah. thanks for your it was, efforts. It's, it's a great being a colleague of yours for about three years here. Yeah. But uh, we, thank you for your time. Okay, here. you're and, welcome. Uh, let's preserve this for history. Okay. okay.